Well, thanks for inviting me to this panel, and it's really an honor to be sharing it uh, with all of you and my two colleagues here. Uh, I, um, I'm always a little bit nervous talking to filmmakers, and I'm nervous talking to scholars because I feel sometimes that I'm neither, as opposed to being both. So um, let me give you a little bit of a background of what happened. I became, uh, I guess, haunted in the late 1990s as the sort of anti-globalization movements were, uh, were ramping up. Um, and I was very sympathetic watching at our own campus what happened around the APEC meeting. Um, I started to feel like I was failing badly as a public or as a professional intellectual because uh, my work, though critical and activist in its orientation, wasn't really read by anybody except a handful of experts within the, um, within the academy, and certainly not by anybody in the demos, uh, among the people, the multitude, uh, who I was hoping to reach. Uh, and it seemed odd to me to be a publicly concerned, publicly funded intellectual with no public to engage with. Um, so I changed course. And in the middle of researching a book that I was working on about the corporate form, a kind of political, economic, uh, Marxian analysis of corporate law, um, I decided instead to try to write the book for a popular audience. And right around that time, and the universe does these things, I met Mark Atfar totally uh, fortuitously at a funeral. Um, we were at the buffet table. And um, I'd never met him, but we got to talking, and I very well knew his film, uh, Manufacturing Consent, Noam Chomsky and the Media. It's one of my favorite documentary films. Um, and we started talking over the you know, egg salad sandwiches and, and whatever, and um, he told me he was thinking of making a film about globalization. Uh, and I told him I was writing a book about the corporation, and within a few minutes, we decided to collaborate um, to make a documentary film uh, while I was based on my book, while I was writing my book, which I, I can talk about during questions uh, if, if you like. It's an odd approach, but it works for documentary in a way I don't think it does for uh, dramatic work. Um, so my filmmaking experience to that point was family videos, but I was very excited to be doing this because I was a film buff, I love film, and I thought the great thing about film uh, unlike prose, because here I was writing for a popular audience, but then jumping it up another notch with film, uh, it has this broad sensorial palette. Uh, you use image, you use color, you use audio, you use sound. Um, you have the ability to move people on numerous levels, to move them in their hearts and souls, um, not only in their minds, and, and through all of these, these different senses. Um, and so we made the corporation. Jennifer Abbott uh, joined Mark and I uh, partway through, initially as an editor. Um, and, uh, you know, it did well. I mean, it did well commercially. It was translated into 25 languages. It won all kinds of awards. Uh, and it was great. Um, and I realized going through that experience, and I guess what I want to share with you, that, um, that my initial intuitions were right. At first, I was a bit hesitant jumping into this, but filmmaking is really a way that we as scholars um, can communicate the critical ideas that we develop, that we articulate, that we argue for, that we rigorously research um, to broader publics. And those broader publics really have to engage. I mean, we have to engage with them, with our ideas, if there's going to be any chance that those ideas are going to inspire, uh, help formulate social change. Um, because what I realized back in the late 1990s was that we were really working on a trickle-down theory of criticism, that we would operate in these sort of elite domains and somehow the activist energy and ideas and analysis would trickle down to the masses. And, you know, trickle-down theories are, are not things that we on the left should necessarily uh, agree with. Um, so I, I think it's particularly important today to try to find these synergies that I've been trying to find between scholarship and broader public engagement through film and also through popular 
pros. Um, because within our current neoliberal hegemony, the social processes of knowledge production uh, in all realms, public, commercial, scholarly, are becoming hostile to the production of cogent social criticism. Public broadcasting is being privatized, being defunded. Uh, in journalism, the unbridled push for profit is eviscerating investigative journalism. It's increasing the power of corporate sponsors and advertisers. It's tightening the grip of the daily news cycle. It's turning uh, information into infotainment. It's deprofessionalizing journalists. Uh, and it's making them increasingly insecure in their jobs. In the university, uh, corporate values and agendas are coming to dominate. The humanities and social sciences, where so much critical knowledge comes from, are being downgraded. Tenured faculty, uh, security, essential for those who want to make controversial stands, uh, is giving way to part-time, temporary, insecure employment. And so as a result of this, and it's happening in, in public education, K-12 education as well, the deprofessionalizing of teachers, it's happening in all knowledge producing domains. And the result is that critical knowledge is in critical condition. Um, and when you look at public debates, you see, I think, uh, the evidence of this. I don't need to mention Donald Trump. I'm sure that example is coming to mind very quickly. So I don't, there's never been a more important time, I think, for us to think creatively about finding synergies among those of us who want to speak truth to power, whether we're filmmakers, academics, journalists, teachers, or whomever. And I'm not saying it's easy to do this. Um, in fact, for me, it's a constant struggle, and I'll talk a little bit about this, hopefully, in a useful way. Um, I've got this war going on inside me between uh, one side saying there's not enough rigor and theory in your work, be it a film or a popular book, and the other side saying there's not enough story and emotion. Um, and that's the, the sort of chasm that you have to bridge when you're doing this kind of scholarly informed uh, creative work. So let me just offer a few reflections and over a, about two more minutes about um, how, at, at least how I do this, and, and I'm not saying it's a model, but I, I start by accepting and not apologizing for the fact that I'm a scholar, uh, that in terms of my training, in terms of my day job, in terms of my employer's expectations, I'm expected to produce scholarship. So all my popular-oriented work is rooted in and inspired by um, either academic work that I've published or academic thinking and, and research by the disciplines of scholarship, the theoretical, the methodological, self-consciousness, the building upon and within different and between different disciplinary frameworks, attention to argument and evidence. Um, scholarly sensibilities drive all parts of my work. I was just in uh, Barcelona talking to the um, uh, people from the new uh, sort of, I guess, neo-communist government that's running that city a communes-based uh, movement, uh, talking to the mayor and other activists. And, and when I was interviewing them, I was, I was thinking about, though not talking about, the work of Antonio Negri and Michael Hart, for example, because it's very related to what they're doing. And some of them actually talked about it. And so I was looking for articulations and responses to these kinds of theoretical notions, ideas about neoliberalism. Um, social change, theories about social change. And when I'm thinking about story selection, um, I'm thinking about where the stories fit within these broader ac uh, analytical structures that come out of uh, this academic thinking. When I'm researching, scholarly literatures are key sources. Um, and what most importantly, I guess, when I'm thinking about what it is I want to say, what's the meta story, um, that's coming out of my scholarly engagements, at least in large part. But then when I begin to write, whether it's a book or a film, I self-consciously switch gears. I draw from journalism and filmmaking an emphasis on storytelling, because I believe stories, characters, plot lines are what truly engage people, uh, emotionally in their hearts as well as in their heads. Uh, stories help us understand how issues might affect us, how they affect the world around us, they make us empathetic, in effect. And so we naturally identify with protagonists. We have reasons to dislike antagonists, like the corporation. 
Um, so stories reach us in our hearts. They reach us in our souls. They engage our emotions. Now, the problem is from traditionally scholarly perspectives, which is why there's this problem in the university that this organization is trying to help solve. Um, none of that is good. Reaching hearts, reaching souls, reaching emotions, uh, appeals to the heart. These don't survive necessarily peer review. They don't get you grants. They don't get you merit pay. They don't get you promotions, at least not in my discipline of law uh, and in many other uh, scientific and quasi-scientific disciplines. I think that's wrong, and I'm really uh, glad to see initiatives like this one, which are starting to push against that, and we can talk more about that. I don't think scholarship is less scholarly because it's disseminated in ways that are accessible to publics outside the university. Uh, the scholarship remains imbued within the larger work, imminent within the larger work, even if it takes a more popular form, which is why, and I'll just conclude with this thought, I, I like to think, and it's not an original idea anymore, I thought it was when I thought of it, but everybody talks this way now. I like to think of the work I do um, as work in translation, uh, that is translation of scholarly arguments and analyses into story-driven narratives. And I think, as is true of any good translation, my hope is the original ideas don't get lost in the process, they just uh, get differently communicated. So I'll stop there and look forward to hearing what my colleagues have to say.